Here's a question for you. What is true? Wouldn't it be great if truth were as concrete as, say, arithmetic, that you could prove it like a mathematical equation showing on paper how you arrived at the answer? As math teachers love to say, show me your work. In a democracy, this systematic pursuit of truth is called journalism. It is a profession in which students are trained to acquire facts. Are you noticing progress that's different than the kids who are at home? And present them in a way that clearly and concisely allows the reader to come to a conclusion that is true. Here is the problem. Over the last 15 years, half of all newspapers in the United States have shut down. And the internet is allowing anyone with a keyboard to present thoughts as truths. What is to be done? One answer is called Chalkbeat. Chalkbeat is an award-winning nonprofit news organization dedicated to local education journalism. Reporters are based in bureaus across eight states and cover the ongoing effort to improve schools for all children, especially those who have historically lacked access to a quality education. Chalkbeat's stories have spurred real-world change in its communities, holding institutions accountable, amplifying students' voices. Just say a couple things you've got on your list. And serving as a reminder of the power that local news has to make an impact. It's Chalkbeat. We do education news. Would you be interested in sitting down and doing a little more interview? The structure of the change makes sense. I am going to try and write up a, a story that just bullets some of the, the major talking points. The governor yesterday, I think it was, said that in the fall, he wants every school to be open full time in person. How are you feeling about that? There's never been a more important time to be an education reporter. Students have been through a very, very difficult year of not just a public health crisis, but also a racial reckoning that has brought to the forefront painful reminders of their daily oppression. Public schools are the heart of democracy in the sense that that's the place where we say everyone should have equal opportunity, everyone should have access to the same education. So I think it's kind of really fundamental to the American promise, but I think it's also a really good example of how America will fall short of that promise because the schools aren't equal. The students are still largely separate by race and income. Some of the disparities that we see that kind of start when kids are in school get perpetuated when they become adults and, you know, in terms of income gaps and health disparities and those kind of things. There's a major education problem in this country on all levels. We are not equal in this country. We are not getting fair education in this country for numerous reasons. And it has to stop. But it has to stop at some point because this is not fair for us. My child is not worth less than your child because you live up in a different zip code than I do. I'm a news reporter working on a story about the school they're trying to put in here. There are so many schools already in Detroit. There are schools around here. And they're not doing anything. The kids are not going to the schools. I was drawn to the fact that Chalkbeat viewed education as an equity problem, as a justice problem from the start. I've heard people say, oh, that sounds like advocacy journalism. Journalism is, is about writing the truth. And the truth is that black kids in Michigan do not get the same opportunities on average that their white peers do. People talk about the school closures in Detroit and especially Chicago as like ghost stories because people have so much emotional connection to their schools and then they close and it's like, it rips your heart out. We prioritize covering communities who are the most in need of what public education promises. Marginalized communities, communities living in poverty, communities of color who have historically been left out of those opportunities in our public education system are actively suppressed from participating in them. We really value the importance of providing a voice to the people that matter the most in the system. 
And the people that matter the most are not the administrators. They are not just school board members. They are the students, the parents who just want to ensure that their kids are getting a good education in a city that has struggled to do that for so many years. And when you can start from that level, it produces compelling reporting and writing. Detroit Public Schools Community District is one of the most egregious examples of educational injustice in the country. Hi. Hi, everybody. Oh, my God. Look at all this. What's going on? Welcome. I'm Kobe. I'm a reporter for Chalkbeat. Before I arrived in Detroit, a group of students filed a federal lawsuit saying that the state, by failing to invest in the Detroit district, had effectively robbed them of literacy. They were learning in buildings with leaking roofs, with pests, with inadequate furniture. We're writing about one of the worst educational disasters in U.S. history. You're talking about generations of people who didn't get the sort of basic supports that our society is supposedly guaranteeing them. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Education is pretty helpful if you want to exercise those rights. The state initially took control of the district back in 1999. They finally got local control back in 2017 and hired a superintendent who had a track record of turning around the school district. And that story of the transformation, that was a national story. I was an education reporter at the Detroit Free Press for almost 19 years. I started there in 2000. When I came to the Free Press, I was one of a handful of education reporters. And then we started to see shifts in traditional media. Advertising was down. And when I left, I was the only person covering K-12 education. And it was really difficult because I knew in my heart that the Detroit School District was, it was a national story. All eyes were on Detroit. So when Chalkbeat reached out to me, I just saw so many opportunities to do the kind of work that I want to do. So I grew up in Chicago, the daughter of a single mother who was a teacher. It never clicked in me growing up on the South Side, attending all black, low-income schools that that was somehow, or that could somehow be a barrier for me. I felt Leaving high school, given the grades that I got, I thought college is going to be a breeze. And I was struggling in every single class except for my English class. The one thing that drives me is it's been 30 plus years since I graduated high school, and not a lot has changed for people who come out of urban school districts like, you know, Chicago and Detroit. More people need to understand the struggles and the challenges facing these kids. And so that's what has driven me, and it's really the reason I came to Chalkbeat. So the city owns that land. Okay. And so the question is, does the city sell it to this group that wants to build the school? They can close all the, you know, regular other public mm -hmm. schools down, so why not put that school right there? Was there something wrong with these schools that they had to take them away? Not to my knowledge. Um, I can actually tell you what was going on when I when I went there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, numbers wasn't an issue. There are 50,000 students attending Detroit Public Schools Community District. Another 30,000, give or take, attending charter schools. Charter schools are a massive feature of the education landscape in Detroit. At last count, something like 60 separate charter school organizations, each of which have their own leadership, their own approach to education. I mean, I've spoken with parents who helped open new schools in the city. They were told that the schools would have beautiful art programs, that there would be a beautiful new building, and wound up finding themselves kicked out, effectively, by a closure because folks failed to deliver. 
KIPP is a national charter school management company. They are coming to Detroit and they are building a new building. They have an uh, enormous amount of funding to build this new building. So I'm going to go out uh, into the neighborhood and talk to people who are living right around the school to see what they think of it. This is a 10 acre parcel of land. The city owns it. Um, KIPP wants to put a school that would eventually have uh, 1,300 kids, I think, in grades K to 12. They'll build it in pieces if the city is willing to sell it to them. And so the question is, should the city sell it to this charter school? My perspective on that, uh, I mean, it's just land right now. Why not? You know, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with it. It'll give uh, kids around in this, in this vicinity, you know, somewhere close to go to. You know, uh, they took away Longfellow and they took away Stewart. So to build a K through 12 here, you know, that'd be awesome. I'm a news reporter working on a story about the school they're trying to put in here. But you know, the thing is that's happening out of the academies, everybody putting their kids in academy school. Well, bottom line question is, what does it mean for a neighborhood to have a school just a block away? Mm -hmm. There's a school a mile away. Some because some people don't have transportation for their kids and like they be, uh, Drop their kids, oh, I've seen people drop their kids off at school on the bus. Then they gotta run back and catch the bus to get to work and stuff. They asked me when I applied for a job at Chalkbeat how I would approach reporting on a community that comes from a really a significantly different cultural background. And I'm a white Jewish kid from the Detroit suburbs and the students in the schools I'm covering are overwhelmingly black and Latino. And I didn't have a good answer for that, really. I mean, there isn't one. The best I could say is that I would just keep on showing up. If I keep asking, keep showing up, keep explaining exactly what I'm doing, exactly where I'm coming from, I don't think I can do much better than transparency and persistence. I certainly am not going to be able to heal just this very broken racial politics, the racial trauma, really, of US history, of Detroit's recent history. And so the best I can do is be clear about my intentions with folks. Make sure that they're represented in a way that is right, that's true to what they're saying and to all the context that they're bringing into the discussion. I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I went to a really diverse high school. White students were in the minority. In this high school newspaper class, my teacher said the mission of the paper is not just to write about yourselves, it's to write and serve the whole school. Big Blair, he called it. Because of my teacher, Mr. Mathwin's charge about the mission of the paper, and instead of just interviewing my own friends, I got up my courage and marched across the high school cafeteria and sat down with kids whose backgrounds were really different from mine. They told me that when teachers saw them raise their hand, they wouldn't call on them. Or that when teachers looked at them, they knew they thought, oh, she's just gonna grow up to be a welfare mom. And I was just completely transformed by those conversations. I started writing about what I now think of as educational inequity. My first job was as an intern at U.S. News & World Report magazine, and I was assigned to be the K-12 education intern. But because of how many rounds of layoffs they had already done, I was also the only K-12 education reporter, which blew my mind. Like, I am ambitious, but this is wrong. <laughs> when I was assigned to write a story, and I drop myself into a place, I learn about it, I write a feature story, boom. Um, but that started to just feel like a really broken system. School board members across the country, parents across the country, teachers across the country who pick up a national magazine, they do change the way they teach and make choices for their children and write laws and policies based on what they read. Of course they do. I want them to be informed by something real, not my parachuting in for two days. The business model is broken. Our national discourse is already starting to break because of this. And then much more important to me was, how is our country going to function? 
like, this was my mission. So I decided to say, you know what, I'm gonna try to create a business model that actually does support the mission. I know that when I was last here, it had, they had just started to kind of come back to the classrooms. Yes, it was the first uh, week back, yes. that's true. How has it been since then? How are they adjusting to being in person? Chalkbeat is nine separate newsrooms staffed by folks who live in those communities. We report on the same people, the same issues, day in, day out. And there's a, an accumulation of information, of relationships, of experiences that begins to seep into your work. We have now 70 people on our team and we're growing fast. We've been able to answer the calls of a lot of those cities that had said, you know, come here. And we still have a 60 city waiting list of places that are saying, we need this in our community. Chalkbeat's funding model is very, very different. They have figured out a way to build local journalism based on philanthropy in a more sustainable and more stable way, I think, than, than just about anybody else. The places where we've opened Chalkbeat bureaus are the places where the people are organizing them fastest to help us come. And organizing looks like having local philanthropists come together with local journalists and civic leaders in the education arena and say, we all are committed to having a better conversation, a better informed conversation, and we're all going to support this. Like, just give me a role. I can do something. That'd be so, awesome. That means we're going to invest money over a three-year period so that we can hire professionals who have job security. A diverse coalition is going to invest. It's going to protect editorial independence. And we have journalists, too, who are going to lead this charge and who are committed to I, uh, serving really the community in together. the fullest sense of the um, word. To kind of make it back to the North Ward, yeah. because the North Ward does have a better I started in New York in 2018. I like lived in New York like City at that time, and so I decided to move here. And my feeling was just that we really want Chalkbeat New York to be rooted in the community, to be reporting for and with the people of Newark, not just about them. How did you deal with, with some of that apprehension that your staff was feeling mm -hmm. about what this would look like, whether or not they had to get the vaccine, just all the uncertainty? Mm -hmm. There were meetings about how are you feeling. Mm. And I think that it helped um, for us to have that dialogue and to really talk about that we too were apprehensive. Mm. So in the mid 1990s, the state of New Jersey decided to take over the Newark School District. And that was based on the evidence that this district was really struggling and they stayed in control of the district for more than 20 years. So starting in about 2010, the mayor at the time, Cory Booker, who's now a senator, teamed up with the governor at the time, Chris Christie, and then they brought in a philanthropist, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, who donated $100 million to kind of fund big changes in the schools. There was kind of outsiders, and especially white outsiders, essentially saying that everything needed to be fixed. And there was a lot of top-down decision-making. Starting in 2018, the state finally decided that the district had made enough improvements to begin transitioning back to local control, where the school board would actually have authority. And that's actually when Chalkbeat decided to open in Newark. It's a really important time to be here and to be watching what's happening in schools. Do you think by the fall that you'll feel ready and it'll feel like you guys are, are prepared to have everyone back? I think we will have all the equipment ready. Um, I think that the students would be very ready. I think that Patrick, they're really intentional about being a voice, and frankly, not even really being a voice, but creating a platform for voices of students, of service providers, of parents, of education leaders, to really come together. The pandemic, it really highlighted the generations of neglect that inner urban areas have received when it comes to school and education. It's always been there. The pandemic just brought out the floodgates. One of the reasons why our schools couldn't open up compared to our suburban areas, even in our county, 10 miles up the road, had schools open since September. Why? Because their facilities are up to date. 
We have crumbling facilities. We don't have ventilation. And why? Because it's years of underfunding, years of neglect, and really years of a social structure that's not working for kids in our district. It's really critical to have on the ground reporters like Chalkbeat. The past year during the pandemic has been very disruptive. The city was one of the hardest hit cities in New Jersey, which was one of the hardest hit states. And a lot of that has to do with the city being primarily Black and Hispanic residents who nationwide were at higher risk, had less access to good health care. And then there were some students who really just fell off the map altogether. How many of your students are even coming into school? Oh, now? None. Really? Maybe one. Joicky Floyd is a teacher in Newark and a parent. Her partner that she was separated from, but still very close to, ended up dying right around the time the pandemic began. Her kids were out of school, so she was trying to help them stay focused and doing their work. The first time I actually met her was when I was writing about these students who had gone missing in the spring because they had to work, because they couldn't get connected to the internet. And so she was actually going and trying to track them down. And she would walk to students' houses because she doesn't have a car. And so she would go and knock on their doors and just ask, are you okay? I just remember speaking to him that first time and just getting so much off my chest. After those first few days, then did you start teaching from home again? Yeah, that Mr. Wall's voice was life, right? Like his energy, I felt his energy. And it was like, I needed that energy. The Star Ledger newspaper ran our story on the front page, which got a lot of notice here. People reached out to her. Some people offered to help give things to her students that needed them. I was ready to give up. I was tired. I was so tired. And then here he comes and, and you know, and just turns everything around. 180 degrees. The anticipation of it all was that it may not work. Mm. We absolutely have to ask the question, yeah, is the pandemic. the pandemic going to give an opportunity for reimagining and reinvesting in this institution that it's become so clear is incredibly vital to communities? Or is this going to be the moment when public education becomes so fractured? so mistrusted that it stops having a shot at being the centerpiece of a democracy that has always been, to me, the best promise of our country. If we all just go forward together and say, let's assume that this is all gonna work out in the end. Let's assume the country holds. Let's assume that public education continues its trajectory where it's learning from its mistakes. If that's gonna be true, then it will only be because we all decided to be optimists. And we all decided to invest in the things that need to happen in order for the country to move forward um, productively. You, went, you know there are schools on this land, the land where they're trying to put the school. One of those things is gonna be a lot of local news, like what Lori is doing in Detroit, what Patrick is doing in Newark. So we're going to go to more places. We're going to answer the call faster of that waiting list of cities and towns that have asked us to come. And we're also going to answer the call to expand this model to new topics of critical importance. I feel really confident that that same kind of experience that we've seen happen in Newark, in Detroit, in Colorado, in New York City, where something that felt so polarized and like no one could have a respectful conversation, let alone make change together, slowly started to melt into a sense of renewed civic efficacy, a sense that we can do this together, that we are all in this together. The sort of enormity of the challenge of changing systems that have been failing people comprehensively <laughs> for a very long time can be overwhelming. Yeah. But that can melt away with a good conversation with the source. Be... You get to make the decision. Are you saying put the school in there? I say put the school in there. How did the pandemic change the sort of application? I'll talk to a child care provider who is just hollering at me about some problem. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm off to the chase again, trying to make 
one more good story. It's one more chance to make a small difference. Education is only one of the many important topics that can benefit from local news coverage. In the fall of 2020, Chalkbeat launched a pop-up newsroom called VoteBeat. VoteBeat provided dedicated coverage of voting and election operations leading up to and following the 2020 presidential election. For the Visionaries, I'm Sam Waterston.